All right. Okay, so um, <laughs> you should have a light bulb above your head, swinging. Okay, <laughs> this is my mother, Marie, and I'm going to interview her for um, our assignment on um, what does healthcare mean for a family interview. And um, so I had it, gave gave her a list of these questions, and we talked about them a little bit because we went back and forth as to whether it should be spontaneous or, but she wanted a little bit of an idea of what the situation was. So um, anyway, we'll just go through them and uh, that's it. Okay. And like I was telling you, I know it's, she said the whole thing is like 10 minutes, but it doesn't matter because even like what I'm saying right now, I'm going to cut out. Okay. So, and yeah, we'll just, yeah. so anyway. Okay. So in terms of like you growing up, and um, you can tell a little bit about where you grew up, like how you grew up and where you grew up. Okay. I was born in Port Angeles, Washington. And uh, the first 10 years of my life, we lived in town. And then the summer I was 10, we moved out to the country. And that changed our lives from uh, being able to have a garden and fresh vegetables uh, I always, uh, my parents hunted and fished, so most of our uh, diet was wild uh, meat, and uh, we used, we didn't go out to dinner very often, we ate at home, um, we had a, a couple of, uh, we had steers for meat, we had pigs for uh for, for our bacon, ham, et cetera. We had chickens, ducks, guinea hens. So basically, in those times, I would say we lived off the land, and that's what our diet consisted of. And you had a horse? I had a horse. Um, I had two, and then um, I, got, I sold one and kept the, I had a gelding and a mare. Uh, the mare, uh, was two years old when I got her, so she had been used as a pack animal, and she didn't know she knew weight on your back on her back, but she didn't know uh, putting on a, the saddle and having a person on her back giving her directions. So we both learned together, and uh, I had her and uh, until I got married, and uh, we had dogs, we had cats, always, always. And at one time, my brother and I had, we caught wild pigeons, and so we kept them in a pen. And we had one uh, pigeon that we called Rebel, and she would come in the bedroom window at night and uh, do whatever she wanted to do. She even laid eggs up in the bedroom. And we had a guinea pig that we carried around, and her name was Mrs. McGinnity. And uh, I used to carry her around the neighborhood with me under my shirt. And... And your cats wore clothes and got pushed yeah, around my in the to, I used to play with my, <laughs> my animals like they were real children. And I would dress them up and take them for rides in the stroller. I even had a rabbit named Susie that I dressed up. And she, she rode around in the baby buggy, too. And I had dolls all the time. Even if I went out in the woods with my parents, I would get a stick or something and pretend like it was a baby. Um, my, like I said, my parents and my brother hunted and fished. I did not. I didn't want any part of it. And when I became like 10 years old, they allowed me to stay home because they didn't want to put up with my whining. And uh, I basically uh, was uh, very feminine compared to how my mother was. She was more outdoorsy. And I don't think that they actually knew what to do with me half the time. So, um, but they allowed me to be me. And uh, I was taught to read before I went to school. I didn't go to kindergarten because we, at that time you had to pay and we didn't have that kind of money. So I started school uh, in first grade. And uh, I basically missed a year because everybody else had already been to kindergarten, but I knew how to read. So uh, I was ahead of the game. And uh, 
You went your whole schooling in Port Angeles. Yes, every, I went from first grade <laughs> to uh, 12th grade in Port Angeles. Uh, I went to Lincoln School through the fourth grade, and then we moved out in the country. So the fourth and fifth grade, I went to Franklin Elementary, and I had the same teacher, Mrs. Syrie, for two years. Uh, and uh, she was fabulous, and I kept in touch with her after I uh, left there. We had junior high after that, and that was seventh through ninth. And uh, we had a teacher there named Miss Glasson, who taught our sewing and home ec. And she was quite funny because she would divide up our, our food for whatever we were making for the day. And she would have eaten half the stuff. So when it came down to separate, she didn't just give us an egg for a recipe. We always had to fraction it down because we would end up with a third of an egg because she had run out of the other ones. Or like she would, if there was something that was nicely already edible, she would say, she would get the kitchens up there to get their portions and she would go, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. So <laughs> we, we hardly ever made anything that was a, there was never a, a full success? course. Yes. It was always <laughs> a fraction of something. And then when we had sewing, she wore nylons all the time, but they were the kind that she mended. So during class, she would have somebody mending her nylons because she always had holes in them. And uh, I don't think she was the best seamstress in the world. And one of our, one of the people in, in our class, Sharon, she uh, would always try to cause problems. So she'd run around and hide or whatever. And Miss Glasson would spend most of her time looking for her. And uh, I, it, it was, I always got very good grades and why I don't know because nobody did anything. <laughs> but uh, that was, I'll, I'll never forget her. We even went over to, Sharon and I went to her house one time and uh, to help her with her yard. But all she, all, all she talked about was uh, when she went to Burma and uh, she had different little decorations and stuff in her house. But I think she was just, uh, she was an old elderly lady, never married, and I think she was just lonely. But at the time, we were not very nice. Put and out. <laughs> Put out. Yes. We were quite upset over the whole idea of, of uh, actually, it was a very easy class when I think about it. <laughs> Nobody did anything. And then and we had to make a, an apron. Well, of course, I couldn't be bothered to know how to do that. So I snuck everything home and had my mother do it and or help me make it. <laughs> and we had to make our own buttonholes. They didn't have buttonhole, the little attachment that they have now. Well, I couldn't do that. So mommy did it. But uh, and then we, have, we graduated from there and uh we went up, the high school was 10th through 12th, and it was new then. And it even had an auditorium where you could do uh, real plays. The, the city of Port Angeles used it too. And uh, it, was, it was different because in junior high, we knew everybody. And then we went up to the high school, and it was starting over again with other people from other schools. And uh, it was, uh, we were called the Rough Riders after Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, I spent most of my time um, writing notes. And uh, I was in drama and uh, enjoyed. I didn't even know that. So what, what did you, were you in a play? Oh, yeah. Like what part? Well, one of them I was in uh, Shakespeare, and now I don't remember what she did. But she, it, was com it was a comedy. And... Uh, and we had the real lights and every, I mean, it was, it was really a nice auditorium. And then I was, uh, uh, I also helped with, in a play with, um, I had to make sure the sets were perfect and everybody had whatever they needed for that scene and things like, oh yeah, I enjoy myself very much. That, that was another where you, you learn things, but at the same time you were having so much fun. You, you forgot you were supposed to be, uh, really uh, in school. It was just a lot of fun. And uh, 
as far as Jim was concerned, I was, as you can tell from my figure, I was not very good. And uh, they had, we had to wear pure white shorts, uh, everything pure white. And uh, anything that in I- In gym. Yeah, in gym. And you had to take a shower in front of everybody. And of course that was all foreign to us. And uh, one of my, my friends, Sharon, again, uh, she didn't want to be uh, nude in front of anyone. So we're all in there trying to hide whatever we could. And she, she runs in there to take a shower, slips and falls and slips on her back and scoots all the way down through the whole shower thing like this. And so everyone knew exactly what she looked like after that. So it kind of broke the ice. And then he, one time we had to climb the rope in the gym. Well, of course, I got barely off the ground and that was done. And it was horrible. I hated the gym. And if I could get out of it, I did. And... Uh, my other friend was very good at baseball, so I always tried to be about around her because if the ball came at us, she could at least pick it up and throw it back. But <laughs> I remember I, uh, one time one of the, the really good pitchers said she wanted me to pitch, and I was like, what, the, what are you talking about? But actually, I actually did pitch very well, and I was thinking later, that should have been my job, not out in the field. So anyway, um, one thing, I was the first person to graduate from high school uh, in my family, which was at the time, I didn't realize how important that really was because my mother just, in the, she quit before she could graduate. She didn't have to, she just decided she didn't want to go to school. And my uh, father was drafted um, because it was the Second World War, but uh, it was a big deal anyway to uh, my aunts, my uncles, everybody. And it was just high school. So uh, that's how I grew up in Port Angeles. Mm. Awesome. <clears throat> okay, so the first question they have is, what does the term health mean to you? What does it mean to be healthy? Well, <laughs> uh, health means mentally and physically, and I am obese and depressed. So I would prefer to be uh, happy and thin. And I'm always striving for that. And okay. <clears throat> What challenges, uh, what types of challenges do you face? It says maintaining your health. Well, obviously a lot. <laughs> well, but you I, like to not maintain your, this for, you don't want to maintain, uh, I would say what challenges do you face, uh, uh, you know, getting further in the health, uh, towards your health goals? I've had the same doctor for over 20 years who, um, has been with me through my husband's illness and death. And um, he has put me on Celexo, which is an antidepressant before my husband died. And he said, you will always be on it because you've had so many tragedies in your life. And Celexo is not a drug that makes you happy or a false happiness. It helps you maintain every day, uh, a calm as calm as you can be and uh it's it's helped immensely and uh i i have diabetes uh too and i have medications for that and i'm not on insulin and uh i have always been overweight <clears throat> and i've always fought the the tiger trying to maintain a healthy lifestyle and i'm one of those people that uh, loses five pounds and gains back 10 or whatever. I don't have, I've gone to Overeaters Anonymous. Um, you were, what was that health drink that you were on for a while? Do you remember in Alaska? Uh, Herbal Life. Yeah. And I tried Herbal Life. 
I even tried uh, shots made from mare's urine. I forget what that was. That put me into ketosis and I, in Alaska, and I got into bed and I thought, I hope I don't die and have my children find me dead. And that did not, that did not work, obviously. I mean, I did live, everything's fine, but that's how desperate I was. And I still didn't do the, what, what I didn't do it right, correctly. I didn't have the right um, information to do it correctly. And uh, I was always trying to, um, trying to do it the easy way. And that doesn't work. It's uh, uh, eating correctly and exercise. And um, sustained. Sustained. It, that's the hard part. Yeah. And then trying to, <clears throat> and trying to maintain that and do that every day. And uh, I think Overeaters Anonymous helped a lot. And I should be going to that. It's a 12 step program. And uh, just like AA. And it really helps you to talk with other people that have the same issues. And uh, I know the first time I went to OA, I was like, why are these people here? They're so thin. I, I don't like this. I'm fat and they're thin. And then you find out all their their mental problems. And then you realize that you're really very lucky. All you have to do is maintain what you're supposed to and not jump off the other side of the boat. But um, I, I had lost like 80 pounds at one time. And now I'm older, fatter. And my body doesn't work as well as it used to. And you think you're doing everything right, but you don't, you're really not losing weight. So it's obviously the fact that I don't, I'm not physically um, working on it as much as I should be. Like even taking a walk. Now I'm worried because I have a, a knee replacement and I fell down so many times before I had a <clears throat> knee replacement. So now I'm afraid of everything. And I'm afraid of walking. We live in the country on the gravel road. I'm going to fall down and nobody's going to be there to help me. And so I have all these mental blocks that I yeah. need to get over. <clears throat> Did you know one of the risks for falling is the fear of falling? Yes, yes. And believe me, that, that's my problem. Mm -hmm. It really is. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's not fun to fall. No, because, and you have to just let yourself go because it's going to hurt either way. <laughs> Brace yourself and break your arms. Yeah, so yeah, old. exactly. Yeah. Uh, one time, <laughs> I this is a long time ago when I was basically healthy, but I had tennis shoes on and I came down a varnished step and I was carrying my newborn baby and uh, I started to slip. So I threw myself backwards and got one leg under the other and snapped my leg in half, but the baby was okay. Yes. And my, and my husband was saying, um, you broke your leg. And I said, that's impossible. You know, and I get up and try to walk on it. Well, I did. <laughs> Badly. Wasn't that your femur? Yeah. It, I got up and tried to walk. Yes. Yeah. I did walk to the car. I wasn't, the leg wasn't broken. There's no way. Oh my goodness. But it was a clean break. So I didn't have to have surgery. That was a blessing. You just, yeah, yep. Yeah. But uh, anyway, that's uh, uh, I, I. My daughter is very healthy, and so she gives me uh, a lot of good advice. However, she's not at my house whipping me because I live in Washington State and she's here in Louisiana. But she does give me good advice. Um. Everyone loves unsolicited advice. That's the best kind. Well, yeah. You notice how I've heard it really well and carried on. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, how would you um, how would you describe your relationship and experience with doctors? A lot of them. Uh, at one point, when I was pregnant with my son James. Yeah, I was in the public health hospital in Alaska, and the doctor was Chinese, and all he would say to me is, you too fat, you too fat. And I, I told the nurse, I said, I'll never talk to that, that doctor again. 
and I'll never have him again. And because my husband worked at the hospital, I never did. But I thought I already know <clears> him <throat> too fat, you know, give me something to help. So um, I didn't, uh, the doctor I have now, I've had for over 20 years. And um, he was active duty Navy, and now he has his own private practice. And he's as thin as a rail, but he understands me. Mm -hmm. And he, he, we have a very good relationship. And I, I was taught that if you don't want to do what the doctor tells you to do, then why are you there? Why are you, why are you bothering? And so I try to do as best as I can what my doctor wants and my uh, lab value, that my labs show that I am trying. Would you give that advice to someone else if you don't want uh, to do what the doctor says? Don't go, don't bother? Yes. And, or I'd find a different doctor that I could work with. But that was what my father always told me, is if you're not going to listen, don't, you know, don't bother going. So I believe that. And so I do try my best. And, and he knows I do because he knows me. And he knew my late husband, too. So I'm very happy with the doctor I have. He's very kind. Yes, he is. He's very, very kind. Now he has two nurse practitioners that are helping him. Uh, and I don't like either one of them. The, the girl acts superior to everybody, and that right away shuts, you know, I just shut down. And the man is just kind of like. He's the one, is he the one that handed you the insulin and then. Well, that was a, that was an old, oh, what do you call those doctors, OD or something? Yeah. Deal. That was a, a, a real doctor. And I came back and asked my doctor, I said, what kind of doctor is he? And uh, he was quite upset over that. Yeah, you didn't actually need insulin. And you no, I never. Insulin I, without any education. So luckily he just gave me it. this. He just said, <coughs> uh, here's, a pre, uh, here's a pin and you start using this and then you'll get the rest in the mail. And he didn't say inject it here, inject it there. How well, you didn't even know it was insulin. No, I didn't. Me and I'm like, I'm not really sure what else there is to inject other than insulin. There's a bunch of different kinds of insulin, but, and it turned out that's what it was. And he, all he told me was read the literature. He yeah, didn't talk to me about free. it at all. Yeah. And, and I was like, this is just uh, malpractice in the making. But yes. um, anyway, my doctor took care of that. Yeah. Do you think you hold any controversial views about health or medicine? Probably. Like what? Well, one of them is don't, like I said, if you're not going to listen, don't go. But um, I think there's a lot of stuff out there now where everybody's trying to sell you something that's going to be the, the easy way out. And, I'm not, and I have tried the easy way out, which doesn't work. But... Um, I'm not, I don't know, uh, controversial, really. Yeah. <clears throat> Wait. How about, um, to what extent has COVID-19 affected your feelings about health? Well, I don't think it was handled correctly at all. Uh, now, before, we were all scared to death, and it was very difficult and very stressful. And we travel a lot, and I, we have to be immunized before we uh, travel. And I have now had uh, four COVID shots, but it was so difficult to get in to get the first shot. And all the rest, I just think that it was not handled correctly, and it wasn't, we weren't given the, the right information at the time. And now that it's uh, several years later, we're learning more and more about it. Like they, uh, there's a big issue of masks don't work uh, the way they said they would. They might work for the person wearing it, but but not for it. It's just the whole thing was ridiculous. And Dr. Fauci, I find, is uh, just a sight of an idiot. But at the time, we were all scared to death, and they shut down. I live on an island, 
and they shut that the island down. You had to wear a mask. You couldn't go out for two weeks. And uh, even when you went to your friend's house, you, you had to wear a mask. And we traveled internationally for over almost 20 hours at a time with a mask on. And I've seen a stewardess yell at passengers for uh, taking down their mask. And I'm thinking, you're not going to be able to throw them off the plane where how many, you know, thousands of feet up in the air. But the way they talked to them, it was like they were going to throw them out the door. And, uh, and uh, really, it was horrible. <clears throat> and then you, um, when you were given your food, you're supposed to take your mask down enough to put a spoonful of something in your mouth. I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous. And now they're talking about... Uh, shutting down again and remasking and i'm up just... in washington mm -hmm. yeah i we've heard tell but louisiana didn't do such a hot job from the beginning of right the right sh shutting down not like when we went to washington is very yeah, and they're, very they're, different they're t they're t talking about uh remasking again because they think there's a new variant coming out or somewhat like that and i'm thinking i'm not gonna do it you know either i'm gonna get through it or got, I'm going to be having my fifth shot at the end of September. And I try very hard to uh, maintain a clean hands and all the rest of it. But when it was first happening, uh, I would make my, my now husband come home from work and he had to wear gloves, throw the gloves away. And I would wash all his clothes and he had to take a shower. Uh, and he worked, all he did was work at the commissary. It wasn't like he was actually physically dirty. And so I just find that they went overboard. They scared us all to death. And then in Washington, our governor uh, was not on the ball at the beginning, and many, many people in nursing homes died. And that was because they were all in close quarters and having uh, the virus was someone brought in the virus from the outside. And the, the, are you talking about the nursing homes? People mm -hmm. were vul very vulnerable. Yeah, because they're already <clears throat> vulnerable. And then people would come in from the outside. And uh, our governor was really slow on, on taking care of that. It was a real tragedy. So, I mean, they would show us on the news uh, how many bodies were coming out to the ambulance. It was almost like... Vietnam when they were showing you the bodies every day or the body count every day. And uh, I just don't think it was handled well at all in our state. Yeah. Well, you, you know, like I said, it, if you, to some extent in Louisiana, it was like it, like we weren't even, we didn't even have COVID. Right. We would you, go you someplace went the other and, way. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so, we were locked down for a long, long time. Yeah. And we, you know, sometimes I'd be one of the only handful of people in the store that had a mask on. Right. But, right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, one last question. Do you have any health goals? Oh, there is actually a question I wanted to ask before that. You've had uh, more than the usual vaccines. Yes. Because of international travel. Yes. And you didn't have like the, 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 no, the thoughts, uh, do you feel like it's because those were standard shots for that purpose or like they had been researched enough or, you know, because I know those those didn't have the same uh, controversy, even though they're very different. Like, give me an example of one that would be really different that most people probably wouldn't get unless they're going internationally. Oh, well, <clears throat> like encephalitis and mm -hmm. things like, and uh, type, well, type not, let's see. Uh, I don't know, the other ones we've taken, um, the encephalitis is because we go to Vietnam and uh, that's the mosquitoes and, and malaria. You have to worry about that. And I've had all different kinds of, uh, in fact, it was kind of funny because when we went in to get our uh, shots for international travel, we had to go to the STD clinic. So there's these two old, people waddling into the STD clinic to get overseas immunizations. But uh, um, the coat, now I will say we were in Albania. And in order to come re-enter the United States, we had to be tested 
and be negative when we flew into Frankfurt, Germany. And then they stamped uh, a, a paper saying that we were negative so that we could get back into the United States. Mm -hmm. But when, <clears throat> when we were overseas, we went to several different countries and we wore our little tag around our neck with our showing that we had the immunizations and no one ever asked for them, ever. And, but in one of the places we were, they did have gloves and masks in your room and uh, the disposable masks, so the whole box of those, but they weren't as uh, worried about it for some reason. And people, <clears throat> people were very cognizant of where they were with each, you know, with people and they tried to, you know, uh, clean their hands and, and things like that, but, but they weren't, um, it wasn't like being back home. Yeah. It, it was, <clears throat> you knew what you were supposed to do and you did it, you know. So do you have any health goals now that you want to achieve in the near future? The same ones every day. <laughs> <laughs> I I am uh, I do have health issues that need to be addressed. Um, I've been blessed to get a new knee, and uh, I will probably have my left knee done in the next two years. And the diabetes is under control, but what I need to do is eat correctly and uh, not be we. My husband and I were more snackers, which is very bad. And we need to be more regimented on what we're not eating all the wrong foods. We're eating incorrectly and too much of whatever, because it doesn't matter what the food is. If you eat too much, you're not going to you know, be healthy. And my doctor has always said, the only, you cannot use all these, uh, uh, things on TV and that the advertisements that tell you you're going to lose 50 pounds in the next two days, all, what you have to do is eat correctly and exercise. That's the only thing that will have that will work. And I don't want to be on insulin. And you're not. No, right and now. I'm not. I, I, I'm not. <clears throat> and you're planning on going to Vietnam. You have a, yeah. uh, again, you have In a December, we're going to spend Christmas in Vietnam because we have uh, family over there that we've basically adopted over the years. And uh, our, one of our granddaughters is having a wedding reception in Hanoi and she wants us to come. So uh, we're going to go over there and then we're going to go to Hoi An, which is my favorite place because it is a very, very ancient town and they have wonderful things to see and wonderful things to buy. And that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, it's a family, our family over there, we love them very much. So it'll be nice to see them. Yeah. And they revere the elderly. So can't forget that. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anything else? Any final thoughts? No, I think uh, I'll think of them later when it's too late. <laughs> We'll get you back in front of the camera. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Mima. Love you. Okay. That was terrible. <laughs> we'll do it again.